amazing the words that you have offered to me to me are just enough to be that thing to be sure. A small congregation in the foothills of the great smokies built a new century. A piece of land willed to them by a church plant. Ten days before the new church was to open, the local building inspector informed the pastor that the parking lot was inadequate for the size of the building. Until the church doubled the size of the parking lot, they would not be able to use their new sanctuary. Unfortunately, the church, with its undersized lot, had, a, had used every inch of their land, except for the mount against which it had been used. In order to build more apartment spaces, they would have had to move the mount out of the backyard. Undaunted, the pastor announced the next Sunday morning that he would meet that evening with all members who had mountain moving space. And hold a prayer session, asking God to remove the mountain from the backyard and to somehow provide enough money to make it paved and painted before the scheduled opening dedication service the following day. Sure enough, at the appointed time, 24 of the congregation's 300 members assembled for prayer. They prayed for nearly three hours. At 10 o'clock, the pastor said the final comment. And we'll open next Sunday as scheduled, he assured everyone. God has never let us down before, and I would believe he would be faithful this time. The next morning, as he was working in his study, there came a loud knock at his door. When he called out, come in, a rough-looking construction foreman appeared and removed his hat as he entered the church. Excuse me, Robert. I'm from Acme Construction Company. Over in the next county, we're building a huge shopping mall, and we need some builders. Would you be willing to sell us a chunk of that mountain behind the church? <laughs> we'll pay you for the dirt you remove and pave all the exposed area free of charge, if we can have it right away. We can't do anything else until we get that dirt and allow it to settle properly at our new site. So the little church was dedicated the next Sunday, as originally planned, and there were far more numbers with mountain moving faith on that Sunday than there had been the previous Oh, that we all might have mountain music faith. But all of us want to be part of something that is bigger than we might imagine we could do all by ourselves. That's probably one of the reasons that we come to church on a Sunday morning. To connect with others and connect with God in a place where we believe that God is present and willing to be with us, to hear our cries of joy, our praise, to accept our offering, our prayers for forgiveness, and where we seek relief from our sins and our sins. We are each part of this community that we call church. That is church with a capital C. Our local church, either this one here, or in Moxie, here for Dino. And we were also members of this larger community of believers that we call church with a lowercase C. This is the collection of community believers that Solomon encouraged to become a part of that community that worship God together in the temple that he had built. As soon as Solomon became king, 
He instituted an expensive built program. While his father David expanded the empire, Solomon built buildings and even whole cities where there once stood only just His extensive building program, unlike any other program the people had ever experienced, for now Solomon's greatest achievement was the building of that temple. The temple would be his crowning glory. People would remember him for generations to come as his glory. Of course, there had been talk of a temple that was built to the glory of God for quite some time. And the Israelites believed that the God, the Lord God, dwelled in the tent. When they were wandering through the desert, they lived in tents themselves. So it only made sense to them that um, God was, would be able to travel everywhere that they were. Whenever the people wandered, God was with them. During David and Solomon's reign, the people no longer lived in tents in the desert. Instead, they lived in houses, in villages, and in towns. It just did not seem right for God to dwell in a tent when the people enjoyed all the comforts of living in their own homes. It was only appropriate for God to have a permanent dwelling place as, all, as well. So Solomon's goal to build this world. When Solomon was done building, there was suspense. And the people waited to see if God would indeed inhabit the newly built temple. There might have been some questions in their mind about Solomon himself, because he was the second prophet of David and Shema. But the bigger question on their mind was, would God actually dwell in a temple on earth, designed by foreigners who worship David God? As he dedicated the temple, Solomon echoed those sentiments but will God indeed dwell on the earth? The day to dedicate the newly completed temple was truly a special day in the life of all Israel. Solomon had delayed the dedication for 11 months so that it would take place on the festival of Jews. The temple was dedicated during the time when the people would remember their ancestors' time in the desert. It was the most detailed dedication found in all of our ancestors. The elders were assembled, as were the heads of all the tribes, as the fame of the covenant was brought into the temple, which would be its new temple home. There was much fanfare as the ark was brought forth and carefully placed there. After it, was, after it was in place, the priests began to leave. And suddenly a cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. While the people's concern about whether or not God would approve of the new temple were real, God's response was resounding. Yes, God's very presence filled the temple. It was an awesome experience. Some doubt bystanders later reported that it was at that very moment that fire shot down from heaven. Perhaps the only thing missing was a marching band or some fire. It was a sight to behold. And Solomon proclaimed before God and all the people. I have built you an exalted house, a place for you to dwell in forever. As he stood before the people, with outstretched arms, he offered a prayer to God. O God, O Lord God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven above or on earth beneath. This was a moment of authentic worship. With the contemplation of the temple, all with the completion of the temple, all the 
people would know that God is the true God. And in Solomon prayed that the people would hear this prayer as well as the cries of those in his church. It was truly Solomon's finest moment when he dedicated the new temple. At that inspired moment, it was as if Solomon could see into the future when he included in his prayer when a foreigner who is not of your people Israel comes from a distant land because of your name. For they shall fear your good name, your mighty name, and your outstretched name. The temple was so beautiful that when people living in distant lands would see it, they would be inspired. Even foreigners could learn of God's omnipotent power. The day would come when people from all over the earth would claim God as the one true God. And people would visit Jerusalem from distant cities and view, and view this magnificent building that would be known as the home of the God of Israel, the one true God. The temple that Solomon built would become a link between the people in our gospel reading this morning, some of Jesus' followers are beginning to fall away from him. Now, throughout John chapter 6, Jesus has been teaching some difficult, difficult theories or things that were hard to understand and even more difficult for them. As some of his followers began to fall away, Jesus turned to the twelve and said, Will you also fall away? But Peter's plaintive thought reply lives on forever. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we have believed and have come to know you that you are the holy one. Lord, who shall we go? You can scarcely imagine anyone other than Peter saying this. And it seems unlikely that it would have been the first response from the critical times or the more philosophical disciple of John. The sudden, unqualified remark could only have come from Peter. At the mere mention of Leaving Christ, Peter's soul was on fire, and the words in his heart overcame the slower processes of his inner life. He spoke with the voice of one who had experienced the power of the words of eternal life. Lord, to whom shall we go? Peter and the other disciples wanted to be in the presence of their teacher. Grandma, who was the closest thing they had ever known to God. That very same God that Solomon prayed would take up residence in the temple. Even today, it is comforting to know that there is a place people can go to feel God's presence. One of those places where we go when we're in the midst of crisis in the church. That's the church with a capital C. A community of believers that shares not only a building, but the joy of community as we come together and worship and praise to God and support each other. Away from their problems, in the quietness of the sanctuary, people can search for some peace of mind. It's not unusual in some city churches to find people who stop in during the week seeking that peace of mind. When life gets a little rough, when people experience the death of their family member or the breakup of a marriage, or have difficulties with teenagers, or experience health-related problems, they will go to church hoping to feel God's presence in their lives. Some just want to sit there, 
while others might be come. Still others will pray, perhaps for the first time in their, in their lives. <coughs> it's the comfort of their sanctuary that helps them know the place where they can go to seek God's presence. Some believers still echo Peter's searching questions today. If not, to, if not Christ, to whom shall we go? There's no satisfactory or satisfying alternative. Only Jesus can satisfy the deepest longing of our hearts. Only He is the way, the truth, and the life. An African tribesman was once leading a group of European explorers through a particularly dense patch of jungle. One of the explorers or not. For the life of me, I can detect no path through this jungle. How can you be sure we're going the right way? The tribesman answered, I am the way. You will simply have to trust that this jungle is my home and that we will not get lost. So it is with God. He is the way. And with him will never be lost. Are you among those who've been told in multiple directions this morning? Are you concerned that Christ may want too much from you? It's time to consider our answer to this question very seriously. To whom shall we go? The truth is that God wants to communicate with us. While no two people have the exact same experience, God does reach out to everyone. People feel the presence of God in their lives in many different ways. Some either tell or feel led into a particular church. Here's the story of Diane, who found herself in worship for the first time in many years. For several months, Diane had felt the presence of God in life. She felt the urgent. But like many people, she tried to dismiss that notion. After avoiding the issue for as long as she could, she could, Diane went to church. As the worship service began, Diane once again sensed the presence of God. When the music began, she said she felt lost. The opening hymn was praise to the Lord, the Almighty. And she managed to sing a word or two, and then stopped singing altogether. I was being battered by tidal waves of emotion, I had said. So she was unable to sing. Her experience of God in worship was unlike any experience she ever had. By the time the scripture lessons were read, Diane was hiding behind somebody. She was hoping that no one sitting near her would notice her too. She remembered the pastor as being a tall man, wearing a white robe. He stood on the lowest step of the chancel, lifted his hands in greeting, and began his sermon with these words. Why are you sitting here? Why are we all here? To be honest, that was the question Diane was considering at that very moment. That was all perfect. It was at that moment that she realized she too was broken, burned, and bruised, and that she could not save herself. As the pastor continued with his sermon, Diane felt God's presence in a way that she'd never experienced or even thought possible. It was as though the pastor knew what was on her mind and spoke directly to him that moment. Diane tried desperately to regain her composure as the service continued. At the end of it, she put her head in her arms and began crying. Lord, she prayed, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but speak the word to me. God spoke to Diane a word that was welcome. Are we ready to be capital C churches to encourage and respond to the needs of people like Diane, who, after not being in church for a long time, suddenly seek God's presence in their lives? As we close out our summer season, 
you remember the lessons from Solomon, then people will seek God's presence. Solomon clearly understood this as he dedicated the new temple to the glory of God. O Lord God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven above or on earth beneath, keeping covenant and steadfast love for your servants who walk before you with all of their hearts. When Jesus asked, Do you also wish to go away? We must be ready to answer. There is no place else to go but to you. When we share this response with others, they might understand that they could be in God's presence right here. Or be bored on When we other when we invite others to come into the presence of God, that might be a day that they hope for them. If only we are willing to believe it. Are we ready? When we're ready. We can help the strangers return a homecoming that they will remember. Amen. Amen.